My name is uh, Mark Fintz. Welcome to a special edition of Bagel Talk. Uh, I am here on the historic Lower East Side at the Blue Moon Hotel at the Davidovich Bagel Bakery location. Today we are going to be doing a talk on the history of bagels uh, in America. Uh, we are right across from the Tenant Museum. We are in the historic place where uh, bagels came to America for the first time from Polish immigrants in uh, Eastern Europe, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the popularization of the product, what it means to be a real bagel, and about whether or not the bagel has moved from being a cultural and religious identifiable product to being an, a truly an American product. So we're going to go inside, and we'll get started with that. Thank you. I have been involved in the in the bagel business for over the last ten years, and I wrote uh, years ago. While I'm not a bagel historian. Um, it, it's a topic of great interest to me, and I wrote a book uh, which was ve very well reviewed called The Rise and Fall of H&H &H Bagels, about uh, the demise of one of the most famous bagel places in uh, modern New York history. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about a subject that you may know about, which is to start out with is if we take these two products, Kaiser Roll, very familiar, you find them in any deli pretty much in all of New York, and you find this product, which is a bagel. A plain bagel, a plain Davidovich bagel. What's the difference between them? We'll put the taste aside and the subjective aspects of it aside, and one might say, well, this is bread and this is a bagel, but it's more than that because they're ba both basically bread products. In my mind, the greatest distinction is, is that for people, particularly people in New York, most people don't have a story to tell about the Kaiser Roll, about their parents taking them to the Kaiser Roll store and getting their first uh, egg sandwich on a Kaiser Roll. The bagel's very different. It's a very different uh, product because more than just being food and more than just being sustenance, it's tied into an identity. Now, this product to some degree is tied into an ethnic identity and a geographic identity, and it becomes tied into a religious identity, becomes tied into a cultural identity, becomes tied into a city identity, and some might argue today becomes part of the American identity. And that's a little bit of what we're gonna talk about. So the bagel, historically, in terms of tracing the roots, it's a little bit hard for, for folks to go. We can go to the 14th century. Before the 14th century, not so much. 14th to 16th century, a little gray. There's some notation of the bagels in 14th century writings. Uh, there's products that are very similar. The, um, the Taralo coming out of Italy, a very similar product. Uh, Polish product, very, very similar product. Um, Russian, the, the, the Bublik product from Russia. But the discussion of the product as related to uh, Jews and related to baker bagels and being referred to as a bagel is more from the 16th century Poland. Now the origins that are prior, it seems that from everything that I've read, there's a very, very, very strong history between the pretzel and the bagel. They're very similar. And in fact, the original bagels, be, for reasons that we'll talk about, were much more similar in consistency to pretzels. They come out of a situation where they have a much more thick crust, doughy on the inside. The original bagels were much thinner and lighter, and they weren't as eaten as fresh because of the fact that they were baked off site and they were sold, let's say, on the streets. So they had a harder, denser, almost more, um, I wouldn't say stale, but they don't have the softness of the fresh bagel. At some point, there's a Division. There's a little bit of a division. The pretzel goes and it lives its life and it becomes a sexy stadium product in the United States and then the bagel as we know. Now, in 16th century, there's some Jewish writings about the bagel, some references to, for the first time, when is appropriate to, to eat a bagel, a uh, discussion of bagels as a gift for newborn babies, as a discussion as a bagel for uh, the bris, as a discussion of bagels for the shiva call, all things that are very tied into Jewish identity. Part and parcel of that be is because of the fact that in Poland, in Germany, and then in Poland, the people who were involved in the baking were Jews. The Jews, not 
we were talking about working class people, people that were to some degree, as has been the history of, of Jews throughout modern history, relegated to certain professions, relegated to certain areas to live, and they became the bakers. Now they were baking for Gentiles for the most part. In many of the places, they were not even allowed to eat baked products, baked bread, which is to some degree where the notion that the bagel is boiled comes from. Because there was some dispensation, you could eat the boiled bread, but you couldn't eat the baked bread. Uh, a little bit strange. But in the 16th century, we start to see that level of discussion about uh, bagels. You then see Polish immigrants doing what? Coming to this area. They come to this area. The bakers are coming to this area. Um, they, they start to establish Jewish communities, very ultra-Orthodox communities, uh, communities where um, Jewish people are aggregating. And as a result, to some degree, we, we, we view the Lower East Side as being the kickoff point for the bagel. Now, as it relates to some degree in terms of the preparation, and, and we'll tie a lot of these things up, for those of you that understand the bagel ties in nicely to Jewish culture and Jewish tradition from a religious standpoint because of the observation of the Sabbath. So the, it, what ha occurs for, for those who are Sabbath observers, come Friday at sundown, basically nothing goes on, we pray, we, 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 we do as, as, as little as it relates to social and work as um, we can. In, in a society, especially in a society that's more homogeneous, it, the Sabbath is observed strictly, and then at the break of the Sabbath, there is, the, there is a somewhat celebratory, we break fast and we eat. So the bagel in its preparation became an ideal product for these purposes. We ended up with a product that we could do what? The bagel is rolled, it's a simple product, it's made of flour, it's made of yeast, it's made of water, it's made of salt, it sits, and what does it do? We do everything that we can for the bagel before Friday at sundown, and it sits. And it sits until when? Until Saturday when the Sabbath is over. Now as a result, there's a byproduct of this. Maybe it wasn't even the intended byproduct. What is the byproduct? The byproduct is that the bagel starts to gain flavor because it sits and the yeast works. And all of a sudden, the bagel gets a little puffier, the bagel starts to work, uh, we start to get that, that sugar breakdown and all of a sudden you end up in a situation where you get you get a, 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 a product that is after 18 hours is ready to go now the Sabbath ends all you have to do is boil that bagel bake it and it's ready to go so it's ideal product for Sabbath observation so those things really do tie hand in hand while it may not have necessarily been all of the intended it is absolutely part and parcel of, of what occurred so now when you have the bakers that move to the Lower East Side and they start to open bakeries, there's a little bit of a change. That change comes in two ways. Number one, the flour used in the United States is a little different from the flour used in Europe. It's a little bit less uh, whole wheat based. So it's a little bit less dense. So that the bagel, and it's a little higher in gluten. So when I discussed earlier that the bagel in Europe is a little, was a little bit closer to the pretzel, even without changing the formula, when you came to the Lower East Side, the natural fact that the bagel dough wasn't as, as dense and then the gluten is working, the bagel gets a little bit puffier. It's important that change because historically, we're going to talk a little bit about cream cheese and lox. People didn't eat cream cheese and lox. Jews didn't eat cream cheese and lox because there was no cream cheese and lox. There was no lox in Poland. There was no salmon in Poland. And there was no cream cheese in Poland. What they had was chicken fat. They dipped the bagel in chicken fat, sometimes a, a lard type butter. So we think about today the way people eat butter, uh, eat bagels, and you say, if I were to say to my kids on a Saturday morning, let's get some chicken fat and bagels, uh, they'd look at me like I was crazy. But when the bagel came to the United States, because it was a little bit puffier, because the hole was a little bit uh, more closed, it became, and it was a little bit softer, it became more ideal for what we'll talk about a little bit later on, which is the, the making of sandwiches. Um, and again, we'll talk about the fact that the bagel became more associated with high class living to some degree and not ghetto living, so people weren't dipping product in chicken fat, but they were eating cream cheese, which was an elegant thing for, for people to eat. The Jewish bakers had a 
stronghold in terms of bakeries. There were, in 1890, there were about 50 Jewish bakeries in this area. By 1900, there were almost double that amount, okay? Tons of bakeries, Jewish bakeries. A lot of Jewish people living in this area. It's a little bit hard for people to conceptualize as you walk through the gentrified Lower East Side, beautiful buildings, a little bit, a little bit different. This was a ghetto, okay? And people sold bagels on the street many times on sticks. They were sold on sticks. They were baked in underground basements here. Roaches, rats, mice, and those were the good quality. And then they would take the bagels, put them on sticks, and sell them on the street. So what occurred there is the Jewish bakers got together and formed a union. And that union became a very, very strong and powerful element in New York City. And in fact, one of the things that's not always well known is that it's the, the, the impact of the Jewish unionization of the bakeries that led as a, um, almost an epidemic for employers throughout the city, the garment workers union and other places where they were bigger unions and had a much greater impact on the power of the unions. Much of that came from the unionization of the Lower East Side. Certain rules were placed, came into effect, some of it we'll talk about later. One of the things that came into effect in those union rules were that all bagels needed to be made by hand. We'll see how that comes into play later on. But a lot of it had to do with the conditions, the conditions in which people were working, the conditions in which people lived in terms of trying to increase the standards um, with which. You had uh, Local 338, which I should have mentioned, was the big union. Now, one of the big forces, which is still around today, perhaps not as big a force, is the, the magazine the, or the newspaper, The Forward, The Jewish Forward, for those of you who are familiar. They were very, very involved in doing something that was a little different, which was raising the consciousness of regular New Yorkers. What they would say to people are, you're eating the food from the Jewish bakeries. The, on a social level, the bakers are in terrible conditions. Maybe New Yorkers cared, maybe they didn't. You're eating stuff that's not in sanitary conditions. People cared more about that. That had the impact of increasing the impact and increasing the uh, cleanliness and the sanitation and all of those things for, for, for Jewish bakers who were, who were working hard. And if you think about like the type of weather we had over the last couple of days, 115 degrees on Sunday, think about being in 1900 in a basement in the Lower East Side making, making bagels. It's really, really hard to, uh, to fathom. I talked a little bit about the chicken fat. I'm gonna, gonna go into the, the because there's a, there's a discussion and um, an evolution of the sides and the locks and the cream cheese as it relates to the bagel's popularity. You start to see an expansion of <coughs> the bagel and an expansion of the popularity of the bagel, but still to a large degree only in Jewish circles and Jewish related circles. As New Yorker's standard of living starts to go up, you start to see the rise of something called the kosher style deli, largely in the Broadway area, outside of the Lower East Side. The kosher style deli starts to have sandwiches that are pastrami sandwiches, uh, corned beef sandwiches, and bagel sandwiches. So the, the bagel starts to make its migration out of the Lower East Side and becomes exposed to higher end people who are now going to see Broadway shows and might spend as much on a pastrami sandwich as they spent on the Broadway show and dinner, the pastrami sandwich was that expensive. So now those people are having bagels. Fish had been always a part of the Jewish culture and tradition, herring more so, chubs, but we start to see innovations in salting and things of that nature to preserve the product and it starts to become a delicacy that gets eaten with bagels. Simultaneously, cream cheese comes out of, believe it or not, not Philadelphia, but Monroe, Chester, New York, the invention of cream cheese to duplicate some fancy cheeses that they're eating in Europe. And it's so fancy that the high-end restaurants in New York are serving cream cheese bricks as dessert. I, I'm done with dinner, I'll have a brick of cream cheese. That becomes my <laughs> dessert. So the Brickstone brothers, believe it or not, we, we know these names from food, the Brickstone brothers say, we wanna do a couple of things, and one is we wanna be able to make cream cheese part more a, a part of the everyday diet, 
and starts to come up with different ways to constitute it so it's easier to spread. They want they, they, they advertise in, in magazines and newspapers and places, trade papers, where Jewish people will be coming up with recipes for chumintash and for different types of things, and it becomes a bagel spread. So now the kosher style deli, the advent of lox, cream cheese, all of a sudden this great new sandwich on the Broadway kosher style delis becomes what we love today, we call the Davidovich here, the bagels, lox, and, and cream cheese, which has become a staple of Jewish identity and Jewish cultural identity here, but not in Europe. It's not that you're going to go to Poland and to the history of the bagel and say, let me have it, unless they're trying to do New York style, they're not going to say, all right, we're going to serve you the bagels, lox, and cream cheese. You start to have this expansion, but you also start to have a, a change in the Jewish identity in New York. You have what people are calling no longer so much religious Jews, but cultural Jews, cultural New York Jews. And what do those people become called? They become called bagels and lox Jews. They're the bagel Jews. They're the people who like their bagels. They love being Jewish. They identify with, at that time now, as we're getting closer to post-World War II, they identify with Israel. They identify with Judaism, they observe the high holy days, but they may not be as inclined to keep kosher. They may not be as inclined to be only living in orthodox circles. You get now into a situation where the bagel is still relatively unknown. And in fact, there was a union strike in the 1950s and the New York Times wrote about it because they called it the Great Bagel Famine. And the New York Times sense was that people didn't know what a bagel was. So the New York Times described this educated erudite paper, the bagel as a unsweetened donut. That's the New York Times definition of a bagel. And with a slight setting of rigor, mor rigor mortis having set in. That's how the New York Times describes the bagel to people who all throughout this area don't know what a bagel is. But people, more people are starting to understand what the bagel is. And you start to see in various small places the discussion of bagels, the terminology of bagels. You start to see something very interesting happens. We don't have Instagram, we don't have Facebook, we don't have Twitter, but we still have social icons. So James Dean, short-lived career, cool guy, rebel without a cause, he's interviewed for McCall magazine, at the time huge distribution, and what does he say? I love bagels. Bagels, what are bagels? Pe James Dean likes bagels, it must be cool to eat bagels. Now the Gentiles are excited. We want to eat bagels like James Dean. So all of a sudden you start to see and you can see how the world is different, but the world is the same, right? I mean, this is a totally different time. Now we start to see the Borscht Belt comedians, Milton Berle, uh, Jackie Mason, guys like that. Those guys are what are doing their circuit. They're, they're around, they're introducing Jewish comedy to people. And what do they call those circuits? They call the circuit the, the bagel circuit. I'm on the bagel circuit, which means basically at that time, the Catskills and places of that nature. So again, we're introducing as popular culture, as technology, as television, all of those things, we have the expansion of the bagel. Then a guy comes along, love him, hate him, angel, devil, a guy who's forever changes the face of bagels in the world. It's actually Harry Lender, for, it's four people really, Harry Lender, his sons Murray and Marvin Lender, and a guy by the name of Daniel Thompson. Daniel Thompson was a West Coast inventor. He had invented, very exciting, the fold up ping pong table. So now you didn't have to have the ping pong table taking up the whole basement, you could fold it and put it in the corner. That's Daniel Thompson's invention. But he also invented something known as the bagel forming machine. The bagel forming machine would be what would help to modernize from an efficiency standpoint the bagel making process. It would eliminate people hand rolling the bagels. But it did something that is perfidy and really frowned upon to authentic bagel makers, which is this. The machine couldn't take the true bagel dough. The bagel dough was too thick. The bagel dough was too... So in order to 
use Daniel Thompson's machine in order to be able to save the money that you needed to save on the labor, you needed to change the consistency of the bagel and make the bagel softer, make the bagel thinner, make the bagel more bread-like, more Kaiser roll-like, but is economic trade-off. That in and of itself probably wouldn't have gone anywhere, but for the fact that the lenders decided out of New Haven, Connecticut, little bagel makers, that they were going to culturize Jewish, make the Jewish identity of the bagel a national identity. And they were not good bakers. They were not good at the bagel, but they were marketing geniuses. They funded and financed Daniel Thompson, built this bagel machine, and they came up with several components. Number one, they came up with the idea, a very simple idea, to freeze bagels and ship them so that you didn't no longer necessarily had to buy the bagels hot on the street. In those days, you couldn't walk into the supermarket and get your frozen bag of bagels. It didn't exist. It was the advent of Murray Lender and Marvin Lender's concept that, that did that. Number two was using this bagel machine. Number three was marketing the bagel just wildly and, and in any capacity uh, marketing. They ended up with television deals. They ended up, for those of you who may remember, as, for me as a child, there was a program called Wonderama. Wonderama was a children's program when you had limited amount of television shows. When you watch that show, if you go back and watch an old clip of it, all the children are wearing a necklace, which is a bagel and a, and a string. It's called a bagelette. That was a lender's he partnered with Wonderama so that every little kid that walked into that show got a bagel necklace as a, as, a, as a giveaway. And that's part of his concept. The other thing that they did was they tried to look at how they could appeal to Gentiles, how they could appeal to non-Jews and get them to understand the product. So they did something which is, again, changed bagel making forever, but for bagel purists, maybe something that's upsetting, which is they said, let's look at the German breads, let's look at the Austrian breads. What are they familiar with? They're familiar with cinnamon, they're familiar with raisin in their bread, so we'll put that with the bagel and we'll make the cinnamon raisin bagel. So actually, Murray and Marvin Lender are responsible for this, the advent of the cinnamon raisin bagel and the door opens to all of the different flavors of bagels that you have today. They did a phenomenal job of doing a couple of things, of popularizing bagels, of putting a lot of people out of work. When I say that, what happened is they broke the back of the unions because the unions would only support people that made bagels by hand, but the economic abilities to spend a little money invested on a machine, but become more profitable as a result of having to uh, be able to pour out these bagels had a dramatic in impact on it. And the interesting thing is that what surveys would start to show is that the lender's bagel, almost across the board, people said, we think this is a garbage product, but we buy it. Why? Because we can't get bagels where we are, out in the Midwest, and the convenience. I don't have to go to some local store. I can just, they were pre-sliced. I can just take the lender's bagel and put it in the oven. So while I think it's a poor substitute, it's all I got. So it, it was a dramatic, dramatic change in terms, of, uh, in terms of the modernization of the bagel and uh, the expansion of the bagel. And it's led to, and I made some notes when I, when I was thinking about this, to today we have the green bagel, the jalapeno bagel, the chocolate chip bagel. And again, the purists will um, you know, cry about it, but it, it has helped. So back to my original point about the expansion of the bagel, it's hard to imagine that in the world today, particularly in the United States, whether you're Jewish or not, that you don't know what the bagel is. You may not necessarily have all that much knowledge of the history of the bagel or what it symbolizes, but it has expanded greatly beyond the borders of Poland and the Lower East Side to the entire New York area, metropolitan area, and the entire country. Everybody knows what a bagel is. Everybody has some concept. Now, many people think of it as the bread with the hole in it, and that is partially true, but only, only partially true. 
in order to really be, from my perspective, considered a, a bagel, a true bagel, first of all, you've got to be boiled. It is the boiling that creates the, this sheen, okay? It's what creates the crust. It's what creates a density on the outside and a doughiness on the inside. The product's got to sit for 18 hours, 12 to 18 hours before it's boiled and baked. This is, goes against modern efficiency. This is why so much of the bagel products today are not like this, but like this. It's not necessarily the dough that they use, that may be part of it, but you can, can sort of deal around that. The issue is that for a bagel to be a real bagel, you can't simply roll it, boil it, and bake it. It kills the texture of it, it kills the taste of it. What happens today is modern bagel makers change that formula to get it in the machine, they then roll it with chemicals, and then what they'll do is the chemicals are supposed to speed up the process. You take the bagel, put it in an oven now, we don't want to take time to boil it, they steam it, and they turn around and serve it. So now you have a product that's no longer got the same kind of dough, is no longer boiled, is no longer aged. So those products, for the most part, when you break them, when you taste them, are like this. Now listening to different people talk, traditional bagels, they say, should be so chewy, you feel it in your jaw. I'm not sure necessarily everybody likes that, but I understand what they're talking about. And again, if we think about the pretzel, mentality. So what's the good news? The good news is that today, because of companies like Davidovich, sincerely you can get good bagels anywhere in the country. It doesn't have to be lenders because there's a little bit of a discussion. I laugh when I, when I hear it and that is, is New York the only place that you can get really good bagels? And the answer is I haven't found anybody outside of New York, despite anything that they may say, that has managed to, across the board, consistently do bagels as well as New Yorkers can do bagels. Do I believe, it? now again, can you match up scientifically the water? Can you match up the conditions? Can you match up the ingredients? The answer is yes. Our, our history has been and our um, feedback has been that there's just a difference between dough products, pizza as well, that you make in New York and ones that are made in other parts. The water's different, the air is different, everything about it is different, as well as the formula, as well as the ingredients. So from our perspective, that's why we've had success in sending this product to Tennessee, where you might say, well, this product is made and frozen and shipped and rebaked, and somebody makes the bagel from hand there. It's not necessarily gonna have the same quality and the same, and the same texture. It's my belief, and I'm talking to David Page from David Page Productions, he's the guy who produced uh, diners, uh, drive-ins and dives, that I think we've gotten to a point where despite what we may talk about in terms of differences of bagels, the bagel has really gone from being a Jewish, European, Orthodox, religious product to a American product. The most recent sort of reason for that to some degree, believe it or not, is the economic real estate bust of 10 years ago. Now, why do I say that? The reason I say that is we probably all know New Yorkers who in a sort of diaspora left New York for better economic conditions when the real estate and, and, and great recession took place. Those people took with them everything, including their appetite for New York food, and went to places, beautiful places in North Carolina and Las Vegas and places in Florida where it may be very cheap to live, but you can't get yourself a good pastrami sandwich or a good bagels, lox, and cream cheese. And those people have to some degree um, created a rebirth of interest in the, uh, the same concept that was created by Murray Lender, which is the exporting of the New York bagel to local places. However, it's benefited because the fact of the matter is, is those people now that they have a lot less money to spend on New York taxes and on New York real estate problems, they're willing to spend a few extra pennies to get something better than, than, the, lenders, than the lenders bagel. 
So for me, I appreciate you guys taking the time to talk about it. It's a, it's a subject of great interest. We could talk about any of these products and, and any of these ancillary products. I will also tell you, just by interesting note, is that while lenders change the face of it as it related to flavors, and while any bagel store you walk into in New York, you might see 20 or 24 flavors, I'll tell you, I don't know any bagel place that probably sells more than five flavors as 50 to 80 percent of their sales it's still plain it's still everything it's still going to be um, whole wheat it's going to be onion it's going to be garlic it's going to be things that pumpernickel of course if you're if you're if you're eating fish so you can come up with your fruit loops and marshmallow bagel all you want and there may be somebody who has an appetite for it is it a bagel isn't it a bagel i'm probably not the right guy to ask however at this point it hasn't changed the overall complexion of the only place, believe it or not, that we've seen a difference in the complexion is the Far East. We deal in the Far East and because there's a blueberry craze there, they love blueberry bagels. But they have no historical relationship to the product for the most part, right? People don't eat those kind of breakfast foods prior to 20 years ago in China, in Korea, in Taiwan. And now that they do, they're looking for something. But aside from that, this is gonna be, for the most part, your number one or number two seller. This and everything bagel is probably 55% of anybody's bagel sales. I would venture to say probably even lenders. So on that note, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that I can, but um, I think that sort of in time wise wraps it up. Okay, so I worked with H&H um, &H for a long time, and that's a very good, uh, it's an excellent, H&H &H is an, an excellent example. Sure, the question was about the H&H &H story. What's the re my relationship to H&H &H and the H&H &H story? So H&H &H was a terrific example of what helped to make bagels from a New York food to a national food. The Seinfeld show, really what really put H&H &H on the map. H&H &H was a great, beloved, um, purveyor of bagels. They made bagels on the Upper West Side. Uh, they made bagels the old-fashioned way for a, long, for a long time. They did a lot of sending frozen par-baked bagels to other parts of the country. Uh, however, Jerry Seinfeld, New York boy, um, Jewish lover of bagels. Jerry Seinfeld is noted for saying, I would rather have a Barney Greengrass bagel than a bottle of Johnny Walker, if you were to give him a gift, than rather a, a Barney Greengrass bagel than a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue. He did an episode about the strike at H&H, &H, a famous union labor strike at, that, that took place at H&H. &H. And it did so much to uh, excite people about the brand that again, we were in this time period where people, everyone could, could have a bagel sent to them that there was this craze for H&H. &H. I got involved with H&H &H at a time that very sadly, the company had a significant amount of, it's all public record, so it's not, had a significant amount of tax debt, had had a significant amount of problems. Um, the, 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 the stories in my book sort of read like fiction because it ranged everything from bankruptcy to labor disputes to murder to um, uh, criminal to tax fraud to all sorts of exciting things. And what was at that point the most identifiable, identifiable bagel company in the world and brand ceased to exist. It was taken over by the government, they, they attempted to liquidate, and essentially the brand died. The positive thing, the thing that it tells you that's very interesting is that when you have a strong brand, and they had a strong brand, is that 10 years later, for the most part, people still know the name H&H, &H, and they still understand the name H&H, &H, and they still know what it, and the fact that Seinfeld is probably shown every single night somewhere in the world in, in reruns probably doesn't hurt that fact, but it just goes to show you it's also the delicate balance between having a good brand and not settling and resting on that laurel. Because having the good brand will make you indelibly identified in people's minds, but it won't keep the bagels rolling once the government comes in and shuts you down. So you gotta have a balance between, between all of those things. But it was an exciting um, time that I was there. Uh, it was exciting to see people. The last day that I was at h and &H, Oh, uh, and they were closing. People were legitimately heartfelt crying uh, on the Upper West Side. And the reason is because, not so much that they knew they couldn't get bagels, because they knew they could get bagels. It was because it represented for them, as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, a time in their life when 
mom and dad took them teething to H&H Bagels and they were teething on a bagel instead of a teething ring and it brought for them very emotional um, stories and emotional connections to their family, to their culture, to their city, and to their childhood. And that's one of the reasons why being in the bagel business is fun because there's an identity to it. There's never a time that I speak to somebody that they, don't, they can't tell you about some relationship between the bagel and their life and their family. So, so thank you. I have a question. You mentioned sure. something about, and I, I might not be able to pay attention, like the people who, who now like treat it with water and steam and whatever, like are sure. those chains or are those like anyone else's main bagels? Okay, so, so, so it's, it's a great question. So for the most part, your local bagel stores still make bagels the old fashioned way. So because they, they usually let it wait and it's for the most part what I'm talking about is you're going to be your supermarket or your chain bagels right. or your uh, your bagels that are made by big wholesalers. Okay. One of the things that's made us different is and, and and not as a commercial for us, but it's one of the things I'm most proud of is that we've retained we do bagels in the wholesale the same way. So what we always say is we're a scalable bagel. So our wholesale facility is five bagel stores. It's not one bagel factory. And that's a very, very big, very big difference. It's not, certainly in New York City, it's not the most cost effective way to do it because we're still very labor intensive. However, it's the right way to do it. And there's your balance. Are you gonna make something that's really a bagel? and you're gonna be a little bit less profitable, you're gonna be take a little bit more time, or are you gonna make something that you call, I had a great, somebody sent me, a, people send me these crazy things, so they sent me a bag of a bag bagels, and it had King Kong on the Empire State Building holding the bagel, New York City bagels, uh, New York style bagels, New York this bagels, and you look at the bus, it's made in Hong Kong. <laughs> you know, and they had all the right things, they, they put all the right, because they understand that New York is the, is the king of bagels. So is have one facility that all your places get it from, so when that we, all Yes, yeah, we make all of our, our, our bagels in a facility that is, and then we ship them out and we ship them to our source that is exactly like you, you get it in, a, they're kettle boiled. In fact, if you go online, you can see some of the videos of the kettle boiling, just exactly the same equipment that you're using, the rotating all fire deck ovens, right. people rolling by hand, seating by hand, using only and again, one of the things is we're kosher and we're, we're pas Israel. And one of the things to understand um, quickly in the interest of time is that when the stuff was in Europe, right, you didn't have kosher certification, you just had kosher, right? But when you came to the United States, there's a whole dynamic of different types of food. So the products were being made the same way and they were kosher, but, but they weren't necessarily, but as food sort of got broader, there was a need to say, all right, we need to have kosher certification to ensure that they're doing it the, the old fashioned way. So our bagels are also, and it's something that's important, right, for the, especially because it's tied into Jewish identity. Our bagels are kosher, they're high kosher, they're certified by the OK, and they're pas Israel, which again is, is that our, our ovens are, are essentially ignited by rabbis. And, and, and the, that, that light stays on, and if that light goes out, you essentially have to call the rabbi to come and, and light the oven.